As I look on these dear faces with which I have spent countless hours through the years, uh, it makes me honored to be here to be a part of this. And it also occurs to me that if there has ever been a finer and greater Quorumdale graduating class, I haven't seen it. And I think I've seen most of them. I bring you today, my dear ones, a love poem. And I say that at the outset so that you'll remember that's what it is. Even if it doesn't seem like that at certain points in my presentation. But it is a love poem. And even if I'm looking out here, it's you all that I'm talking to. It has to do with what I hope will be and some things that I hope won't be. I'm 50 years old now and I've watched for a long time. And for better or worse, these next few moments you're going to hear from my heart in love what I believe most important is what I can give you today. It's entitled Graduation Day. And it might not surprise you to know that it's a story. Mark and Susan and Kim and Tom did not go to any particular Christian school. And they went to every Christian school. Every day and every year, their moms all waited in line in their SUVs outside school. And they dropped them off in the morning. Then they picked them up in the afternoon too. Around the school were lots of nice new homes that were not so fancy to those in the community, but would have looked like palaces to most of the people in the world. Mark and Susan and Kim and Tom never thought about graduation day as they went through elementary and junior high school. They were all from Christian homes, and most of them lived miles from the poor, the orphaned, the homeless, what at least one local pastor called the refuse, the floatsome and jetsam of society. All their families attended handsome new churches pastored by handsome youngish men. Their houses and their churches and even their schools were all handsome and new, and they were safe too. And Mark and Susan and Kim and Tom did not even know how dangerous it was outside of these, where some of their parents had been when they were younger. But it looked exciting out there in ways, so some of them began to go out there some after they had heard about it from their older brothers and sisters. And they went out there even with some of their friends who also lived in the nice safe houses and churches and schools a long way from the dirty and bad people. Mark made good grades at first and everyone thought he was a clean living person like his parents. But even though they told him it was okay for them to drink the liquor they kept in the top cabinet, but he was too young to drink it, plus it was illegal, he saw that they were really happy when they drank it, and they talked with their friends about the next time they could drink it together. So he couldn't wait till he could drink it and be happier than he was and less bored. Though he wouldn't do it where they would know about it and it would hurt their feelings or get him in trouble. It helped when some of his friends from school and church wanted to do the same thing, so they finally got to. He got sick and in trouble, but he and his friends couldn't wait to be that happy again. Then one of their older brothers, who had a friend in college, brought other things to a party that could make you even happier than drinking. And Mark started doing those things too. Every now and then, Mark felt guilty when the headmaster would talk about being a pure and stainless soldier of Christ. And his pastor would preach about being in the world, but not of it. But Mark was so much happier doing the things with his friends than he was doing church and school things Though he kept doing those so he wouldn't get in trouble and he would be able to keep doing the things that made him happy and wouldn't make his parents sad. Plus, he could tell that his parents were happier when they did these other things too because they changed churches every couple of years. And even though they said they were excited about getting up and going to church on Sunday morning, he could see after enough years of watching that they weren't really. And sometimes they wouldn't even get up at all. They would all just sleep in, and after a while, Mark liked those Sundays better. 
because then he could sleep late and no one would notice how hungover he was from the night before, like he was afraid they would when he went to sleep in church. He was a good baseball and basketball player, and Coach was saying he might be the first student from the school to get a Division I scholarship. But as graduation day got near, he needed the things that really made him happy more and more. Plus, he had a girlfriend now that could make him even happier, as long as he had those other things too, because even now, because now even she couldn't make him happy if he didn't have those other things. More and more people started to find out what he was doing though, and trying to take away the only things that really made him happy now. He had never cared much about his grades, but he had cared about baseball and basketball. And once, a long time ago, he had gotten excited about helping the children in Peru and Haiti after the youth pastor talked about them. But by the time graduation day came, he had left all those things behind because none of them could make him happy anymore. And he was even beginning to wonder if the things that did could keep doing so. Those were some of the things he was thinking about when he and his new girlfriend, who had never been to the Christian school or any school for the last year, went to the lake with some of his friends who used to go to the Christian school, and they stayed happy for two days. And he only remembered once the whole time it was graduation day for Susan and Kim and Tom. He hadn't seen them lately anyway, and he never saw some of them again. He kept on doing the things that made him happy, and till a few years later he died. And after that, nothing his parents did could ever really make them happy again. Susan saw Mark change and it scared her. She was afraid to do those things, even though she secretly thought some of them might be fun. But her nice house and family and church and school helped keep her safe. And she even made good grades. But she was usually kind of bored even though she had quite a bit of fun with her iPod and Zanga and Facebook. And she even wrote a great essay and did a great job in the school play her senior year. And the teachers were so proud of her, especially when she won a full scholarship to the Christian college where her parents had attended and met. But she was just so bored. And after a while, she gradually stopped going to church and college, except when she came home for the weekend. Susan had always been cute, and she seemed to get even a lot cuter in college, and for the first time, unlike when she was back at her safe house and church and school, lots of young men really began paying attention to her. Some of them were like her and didn't go to church much anymore, but one young man did. She really liked him, but he was quieter than most of the other boys and didn't take her to do some of the exciting sometimes even sort of dangerous things they did. Still, it made her feel kind of guilty for not going to church and reading her Bible and praying. So she started doing those things again. After a while, though, when she didn't see the quiet young Christian man anymore, it really didn't bother her that much because she kept getting cuter and learning new ways to make herself even cuter. And more and more exciting boys kept calling her, and pretty soon she didn't remember about going to church or reading the Bible or praying or the quiet Christian young man either. Her parents were a little concerned when she married a young man from a non-Christian family, and her mother at least suspected that Susan's dress on her wedding day was not rightfully white. But her new husband loved her, at least for the first few years. And he was funny and handsome and smart and became very successful in business, though he had to go out of town a lot. After a while, they were so busy with their two kids, all the activities and such, and it took her a while to realize he never had that look in his eyes anymore like he used to, even when he was in town. She started wondering secretly if, rather than never having that look anymore, he had it for someone else. Eventually, her fear gave way to anger, which gave way to desperation. And she remembered about church and her Bible and praying. She even asked him if he would go with her and the two kids, but he had no more interest in that, even less actually, than he'd had his entire life. By the time of the divorce, she had forgotten about the church things. None of that stuff works anyway, she assured herself one day. When she came across an old picture of her little Christian high school senior class on graduation day. 
She did occasionally shoot a quick prayer to God when she was driving or showering or the like that he would protect her 14-year-old daughter who was really starting to miss her daddy. That he would protect her from any harm from all the boys she was instant messaging on the internet. Well, Kim was as sad as anyone as she witnessed the demise of Mark. It was clear to her what had happened. He ignored everything he was taught. Kim did fine at the Christian school. She didn't make terrific grades, but she passed everything, usually with at least B's. She was never a star, but she participated in various activities. She didn't win any of the school's character or best citizen awards, but she never got in trouble. She believed what her parents and church and school taught her, and that kept her on course, for the most part, for she believed both the spoken and unspoken lessons they imparted to her. Thus, she believed that she was a sinner, that Jesus died for her, that believing in Him, what she had done at seven years of age, delivered her from everlasting damnation to eternal bliss in heaven, that she should follow the Ten Commandments, read her Bible, go to church and youth group, witness her faith to others, and go on occasional mission trips. She also believed that she wished Justin, the school's handsome star athlete, pianist, and straight-A student, would look her way, and that she could be married to him or someone like him very soon, and that she must work tirelessly on her external appearance to have her choice of the right boys as her husband. Oh, also especially as she advanced through her years at the State University, that that husband must come from a good and wealthy Christian family, and that he himself must have unlimited career prospects. After all, the safe home where she had grown up was one of those fancy houses near her Christian school, and she couldn't imagine the $35,000 BMW her parents gave her on her 18th birthday being the nicest car she would ever have. So Kim's college years came and went, and she met Danny, the handsome young man from the ritzy neighborhood who was headed for law school. It wasn't long before Kim and Danny's house was larger and nicer even than the fanciest ones around her old Christian school. And even her own daddy was impressed with the spanking new Hummer Danny's parents bought for her as her personal car for getting her three cute toe-headed kids around and making meetings at Junior League, the Country Club, the Arts Council, Pilates, and the weekly women's Bible study at church. There were, of course, the occasional hiccups along the way. She and Danny had to vote for the removal of the earnest and godly young pastor whom Danny's wealthy boss, who was also chairman of the church's elder board, wanted to replace with someone more exciting. They also supported their Christian school's decision to lower admission requirements, reduce academic standards, raise tuition, and relax the dress code, all while raising money for the new football stadium. And Danny had the good sense not to donate that old 12-story hotel building he owned to the foster home organization as he had planned, but to sell it to the new Budweiser distributorship. Oh, neither he nor she drank other than wine, his beer with his hunting buddies, and a little bit of champagne at weddings, but they had a big new mortgage payment, and there was no way they could afford that and donate the old hotel. But she and Danny got along well, especially compared to so many of their friends and spouses. Still, she continued to have the driving urge to build an ever, ever nicer, safe home than to redecorate and update and add on it once she had, until it was time to start looking for a still nicer, bigger one to build. Her children were well behaved for the most part and never got in serious trouble. Still, the suspicion nagged her for years that none of them were gripped with any deep spiritual conviction or passion. They went to church when told, mostly didn't through college, then returned afterwards. They are all good participants, she thought, when the 20th anniversary invitation of her high school graduation day came. How quickly the time has passed, she thought, startled. So thankful she was that they, like herself, had found their own safe, fancy houses, churches, and schools amidst an increasingly secularized society 
that seemed to be crumbling in every direction, even as it grew wealthier and more technologically advanced. Thank the Lord we are all safe, she told herself again the day she went with her oldest daughter and picked up her first Hummer. And finally, Tom. Tom was smart, but the hard times for him had begun at birth with a serious case of asthma that caused the boy to carry a breathing device with him his whole life and kept him out of nearly all sports. Only a few years later, his daddy died. Tom was to learn as he grew older, however, that his father's godly example and commitment to Christ and his family, even though he died at a relatively young age, would provide a stronger legacy than nearly anyone else gained from a lifetime with their parents. The two things he dimly remembered his father saying to him were, be kind to those less fortunate than you and stand up for what you believe to be right, no matter what the cost. As the years passed and he saw the other boys' daddies come to various events and take them on trips and outings of all sorts, he wondered what that would be like. When some of the bullies at school picked on him, stole his lunch, or made faces to the cute girls when he answered the hard questions in class that those other kids had no clue about, he wished he had a daddy to tell about how it hurt his feelings. Tom's mom was a strong and godly woman, but sometimes Tom could not help crying himself to sleep at night. Still, though, he always cheered for those other boys when they played sports for the school. Even when his thick rim glasses got fogged up because of the heat in the gym sometimes. He also prayed for them, which he found the best remedy to quash resentment. Gradually, as his class advanced through high school, he did gain more of the reputation of a nerd, even for many within his Christian school and class. So he won some awards and had a few friends, but he was never really popular. In fact, loneliness and Jesus were his two most constant and dependable companions all those years. The subtle and not so subtle jabs from many of the other boys and even some of the girls never really stopped, even up to graduation day. He actually made more friends in college and he worked hard nearly every day, not just in class but in many things. Student government, moot court, Habitat for Humanity, his college youth group, and his church, not to mention the sometimes painful labor of visiting his grandmother who suffered from Alzheimer's disease and the autistic young inner city boy he mentored. And he struggled with feelings of jealousy towards some of the more handsome and popular young men on campus, as well as with not infrequent bouts of despair whose origins he did not know. And he fought temptation in the moral realm. He had seen images on his computer that seemed burned in his memory but which he prayed for God to remove and which, due to painful obedience and even suffering, gradually did recede from his memory. He knew some of his friends were growing addicted to things on their own computers. He noticed some of them would be on their laptops privately for hours on end. Gradually, he noticed a devout young woman named Lori. Through common activities and interests, a friendship blossomed. A challenging relationship it was, for it seemed as though every guy on campus, including, truth be known, Tom, was chasing after Lori, while she seemed to have some mysterious special relationship with a single missionary guy somewhere whom no one had ever seen. More than once, Tom wondered if the torture his unspoken feelings for Lori brought him were worth the blessing of her remarkable company. In the midst of this, too, Tom once again began to notice that he was saying things and taking stands on campus and in his Christian activities as well that to him seemed natural, especially for Christians, but that to many others seemed less certain. By his senior year, though, despite the opposition of many students and some liberal faculty and the downright hatred of others, he seemed the shoe-in winner for president of the College Young Republicans Club. He wanted it too, having labored for years as a poll watcher, precinct chairman, phone bank captain, and even driver and gopher for various candidates. 
His winsome roommate, Jim, meanwhile, was one of the most popular and respected students at the entire university, not to mention a varsity tennis standout and star of the annual college stage play. But more than once, Tom noticed that Jim had left impure images on his computer screen in his room. After several warnings, it happened again one night when Lori and her friend Alice came over to study. This time, Tom told Jim one of them would have to move out. That would not be the end of embittered Jim, who decided at the last minute to run against Tom for president of the college Young Republicans. Jim utilized the help of all his many friends, paying them from his enormous trust fund as campaign workers and paying other students just to vote. He plastered the campus with posters and signs and paid still more people to tear down all of Tom's and spread ugly rumors about him. And he publicly asked Tom about two opinions Tom held that were not in keeping with most other members of the organization. Knowing he could cinch the election by going along with the crowd on those two issues, after praying about it, Tom nonetheless held to his positions, which he believed were scriptural. The final results gave Jim two more votes than Tom. Observing Jim's gloating countenance and seeing the impressive throng of young men gathered around Lori across the room, Tom felt despair and loneliness like never in his life. What would Daddy do, he wondered, choking back tears. When Lori saw Tom go to Jim, who towered over him by seven inches, in front of all the college Republicans, shake his hand and congratulate him even though tears blinded his eyes the whole time, her heart stopped. And so, long years, even decades later, when many of the dozens and dozens of grandchildren and great-grandchildren would gather around godly old Grandma Lori's feet in front of her rocking chair and fireplace and ask her to tell the stories again of their amazing grandpa or great-grandpa, Tom, she would get that gleam in her eyes. And when did you start liking him, Grandma Lori? Before or after he became a judge? They would shout, knowing full well the answer. Was it after he was already a deacon and an elder? They would beg, knowing that answer too. It was when I realized that here was the first boy I had ever met who was the person my daddy had always described for me my husband should be, she said. But what was that, great grandma, they shouted. The hands and feet and arms and legs and mind of Jesus on earth, she said, wistfully remembering. A person who was kind to all and stood for what they believed was right, no matter what. Then, seeing her oldest great-granddaughter, tall, shy, awkward, godly Angela, who was the most like Tom of any of all the children, seeing Angela standing across the room, lonely, misty-eyed, reverent, in awe. Grandma Lori smiled, nodding, and said, Better run along, honey. You'll be late for your graduation day. I love you all.